have some incredible panelists over here, as you can see. We have Tessa Price from We Work Food Labs. We have Peter Bodenheimer from Food X, and we have Natalie Schmulik from The Hatchery. So I wanted to go ahead and give everyone a chance to quickly introduce themselves and what they do within their program in case you're not familiar. So let's go ahead and kick things off with Tessa. Sure. Hi, everyone. Uh, my name is Tessa Price, and I lead programming for WeWork Food Labs, which is a newer initiative within WeWork. Our goal is to build physical workspace for earlier stage food and beverage companies. And then on top of that, we also operate a food accelerator where we directly invest in companies who are uniquely positioned to do two things, the first being disrupt the food industry, and the second being to have an impact within the future of food in the workplace. All right, on to you, Peter. Hi, I'm Peter Bodenheimer. I'm the director at FoodX. We're the oldest food-specific accelerator. We invest money in about 16 companies per year across two cohorts. We're a venture-funded program, so we're part of SOSV, which is a traditional venture capital firm uh, with about $600 million in assets under management. And we look across the whole food system in terms of the companies we invest in, but we have three principal buckets that we are focused on. Food is medicine, the intersection of food and medicine, uh, how we buy and sell food, so the future of food commerce, that can be retail tech, supply chain technology, new direct-to-consumer models, and then sustainability. And, and as part of that, things like uh, alternative proteins, which I know have been talked about quite a bit, here at the, at the conference and in general in the world right now. Um, and our, our program, what we do is we invest about $125,000 in each company. We take a, an equity stake in the company, work with them over about three and a half months for the program. And then I think one of the things that we'll talk about this more that, that differentiates us from different types of programs is our, our intention is to continue to invest in future rounds with the companies that we work with. Amazing. Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Natalie Schmulik. I'm with The Hatchery Chicago. We are a nonprofit food and beverage incubator. We were operating as a virtual incubator for several years and then just opened a new facility in East Garfield Park on the west side of Chicago. We opened a 67,000 square foot food and beverage manufacturing facility that houses a shared kitchen, co-working and office space, 54 private food grade production spaces, ideation space, and a full curriculum, as well as one of our parent companies, Axion, a nonprofit micro lender to provide financial support. So we really try to focus in on three major areas of need for food and beverage entrepreneurs, one being access to food grade production space, the second being access to financing, and the third being access, having access to resources, but then a full community and, and a well-run ecosystem of like-minded individuals, experts in the industry, and all kinds of support throughout. In addition, we try to support our local community. We are in an area which has some of the highest unemployment rate and the food and beverage industry has some of the lowest barriers of entry. So we try to provide free membership, free job readiness training and serve safe training to local community residents and then also HR support to the entrepreneurs who will be hiring for the first time uh, in our facility many times. So we try to have a placement program where we bring in local community residents that are trained to work with the startup food companies as they grow and that way they're also able to launch their own businesses and build a sustainable concept in our space. Fantastic. And then quick aside, we do not have the confidence monitor up right now. So if someone could do that slash if someone wants to give me a wave when it's like 210 so that I know it's time to start winding down. Yeah, Alex is on it. Thank you. Um, so Natalie, you, the hatchery is an incubator. And I think a lot of people don't know the difference between the two. I didn't until I started researching for this panel. So can you give a quick background about what makes an incubator an incubator as opposed to an accelerator. Sure. And there's a lot of elements that are interchangeable. The Spoon put out a great piece on what is a food accelerator versus incubator. And I think there's room for accelerators and incubators. Incubators traditionally tend to start on an earlier stage of business. So we work with companies right from the inception. We run a monthly starting a food business class in our space. And that way we're seeing companies right when they're just thinking about market demand and needs and 
and they want to create something. And then we stay with the life cycle of the business. We do not invest, nor do we take equity. We do have financial support, and we connect with a network of investors, venture capitalists, angel investors, accelerators, where we actually will advise some of our members once they reach a certain stage to then apply for an accelerator program, which is a little bit more intensive. Companies are at a certain stage, and if they're the right fit for that accelerator, it really can propel the business forward. So we really tr try to provide that wraparound support right from the early stages of the business. I, I think it's also worth mentioning that accelerator, incubator, studio, they get thrown around and, and they mean different things to different people. So if you're looking at a program or talking to them, ask them what it is that what they call themselves means to them because you may find that people think of accelerators differently or incubators differently and define them differently. So it's, it's always good to ask and get clarity. Yeah. That's absolutely a good tip. And Going off of that, I'm wondering, you're giving advice. We definitely have some new startups out here. We saw them pitching on stage yesterday, getting awards today. I'm wondering what you guys look for when you are putting together a cohort of people for an incubator or accelerator. What qualities do you look for? And what qualities do you sort of keep an eye out for saying this might not be a right fit for us or for an accelerator in general? Yeah, that's a, an amazing question. So for our first accelerator cohort, we had over 750 applicants, which was tremendous, but also a little daunting. So definitely for how many have, spots? For, uh, for eight spots. Oh, and no. I, I know that <laughs> Peter sees similar numbers um, for their program. Not quite that many. I mean, yeah. that's, that's a huge number. Yeah, it was, it was pretty tremendous. I think the number one driver for us is founder energy. We love to connect with companies who are so passionate about what they're doing, about the potential for disruption within the ecosystem, about the potential to work with WeWork. So uh, we're able to leverage a lot of the resources within our ecosystem when we're building out this program. Um, and the program that we operate is not a set curriculum. So we have themes that we move through over the course of the program, but we work specifically with each startup to identify their goals for the duration of that cohort, speaking to your point of kind of getting to know the accelerator that you're talking to um, and what their intention is. For us, it's really about identifying an area within that business that we really feel like we can leverage WeWork's resources um, and our ecosystems, ecosystem partners' resources to support. So uh, for us, it's founder energy and, and potential um, and excitement around disruption. I think there's a lot of overlap, obviously. Um, I think persistence, it's hard to, to figure that out in interviews, especially if they're remote. But getting to the why that an entrepreneur has started something, understanding whether they're doing it just because they think it's an easy way to make money, which, you know, spoiler alert, it's not an easy way to make money. Like, you can make a lot of money, but it's never easy. Um, or whether they're doing it because of some really driving reason that means when shit gets tough, which it will, and the ups and downs happen, will they stick with it or will they say you know what, this is really hard, I'm going to go get a job, or I'm going to, you know, I just don't have it in me anymore. So I think that, to me, is one of the most important things, is do they have persistence? Can we, can we feel that they're doing it for a reason beyond just sort of short-term goals? And then I think we also look for teams. You know, we, I, we can have the discussion about solo founder versus teams, but having relevant experience in different areas that kind of supports one big goal is super important. And so if we find people that have a blend of experiences that complement each other and they're kind of focused on going to the same goal, that's a real plus for us. Just to add to what Tessa and Peter said, because we look for exactly the same things, I think the founder presence is so important. Right now, investors are investing just as much in the founder as they are in the business concept, and it's really important to see that drive and grit come from the founder. We do look for a lot of elements that really reflect that. So we try to look at companies that are invested full-time, whether it be the individual or between the partners, it's a full-time job for them because if they're not believing in their business enough to fully invest in it, nobody else will. So we do try to look at that. We are also looking for companies that 
aren't necessarily hobby businesses, but really are designed for growth because our mission is around job creation and economic growth. And if these companies aren't growing and developing, then they're not able to hire and bring new people on. So it's an achievement for us when somebody flies out of the nest. And so it's important to see these strategic yet realistic growth plans when we bring companies in. So to, to kind of build on that a little bit, you mentioned that you're part of your you know, goal is job growth. And for us, it's about people that are building what we would consider venture scale businesses. And I know that's a phrase that probably frustrates every entrepreneur in the room because it means different things to different people. But that's a, that's a qualifier for us. We have to believe that this is a business that is going to go on and, and raise capital beyond what we're putting in and grow to a place where there's going to be a meaningful exit because that's our model. And so understanding the difference between the different models matters because ultimately as an entrepreneur, you have a vision of the business you want to build and you want to align with uh, investors and a and a program that's going to help you get to build that business, not some other business that you're going to get kind of forced down the path of. Yeah, and I think since you brought up capital, that's a great point. You ask what we look, what we don't look for um, in in companies, and I think when companies approach us, and Peter, you and I have spoken to this before, and it feels like they're just after a check. That's so unappealing, and also just is a good indication they might not understand the the business entirely because accelerator money is typically expensive. Um, so we are always looking for companies who the check is a bonus. It allows them to focus on the program. It allows them to maybe add to their team and really dedicate time to focusing on their current business challenges, but it's not the be all end all for why they're applying. So on the flip side of that, startups just after a check, maybe accelerator incubator isn't right for them, but who is sort of for people maybe here thinking about it um, or who know people who are thinking about it, what is the perfect sort of candidate for an accelerator? Who, what stage should the company be? What should they be hoping to achieve? Um, and, and why go this route as opposed to say just going to raise capital independently? So I think that's a different answer for every company to some extent. Um, for us, the companies we look at, it's great if they have a product that they're they're past the very initial stage of creating that product. Whether it's a tech product, whether it's a food product, whether it's an ingredient technology, there's some, something that they are able to go out and start to commercialize. Um, so that's important. And they need to have enough structure in place that they can make use of the time in the program because that's the, the three and a half months in our case, some, some are longer, some are shorter. That's your time to work on your business, not just be working in your business. And actually being able to step back and take advantage of the resources that you get under this very compressed timeline. And if you're too busy trying to run the day-to-day -day of the operation, you're not gonna maximize what you get out of it. And the more you think about what it is that's going to move your business to the next level and you have clarity on that coming in, the more likely you are to have success and to look back on your experience in the accelerator and say, wow, that was really worth my time. My business is further along today than it was and not just because it's three or four or five months later, but because you actually were able to connect to the right people in the network and get the right things done. And a resume builder, I'm assuming, as well. I mean, people know the names. There's a certain amount of, I think, credibility that comes from being part of a program, whether that's with investors or corporate partners. Um, but that's, that's, I'd say, almost a lesser part of it because at the end of the day, it's about the founding team and just because you have the stamp of approval of a program or an investor, that doesn't, it might help open a door, but it's not going to get the deal done at the end of the day. Uh, Natalie, I know your timeline for your accelerator or your incubator is quite a bit longer, if I correct. I actually went to go visit the hatchery in Chicago, which was fantastic. So what do you recommend? You said a little bit what, what you're looking for, but what do you think startups um, 
should be approaching the hatchery hoping to achieve and why, why take that path as opposed to um, one of the many others that's open to them? The first thing is really we like to be very inclusive and we try to get people into the habit of using lean startup methodology. So that means we do get a lot of people come through our door. Certainly we have a lot of, we'll accept a lot more people at the stage they're in. But I think Peter brought up a good point, which is it's, you know, a lot of times entrepreneurs get into the space thinking this is going to be a big money making business and it's trendy just to be a food and beverage entrepreneur. So we recognize that and we realize that if we can provide some clarity around that and create a program where people can get in in two hours, learn a great deal about the licensing, financial commitment, um, branding, doing competitive analysis. And usually in our starting a food business class, 50% of people will leave there going, I'm glad I tried it. Maybe it's not for me. That is equally a success for us because we don't want everybody to leave a class going, yeah, this is easy. I'm going to start a business tomorrow. We actually want to provide as much information as possible. So if we can get people coming in, listening to the content, and then going, hey, there's other ways I can probably be involved in the food industry without necessarily recreating the wheel or launching somebody something that I think is new but isn't necessarily new, that's really important to us. So we try to get people in there quickly, give them the information they need, Part of the reason we have the shared kitchen, which builds the pipeline for private spaces, is so that people can rent out kitchen space by the hour, start to develop their product, really understand the efficiencies that are required to launch a food business. And then once you start connecting the dots and realizing how much it costs and the intensity that's involved in it, you may end up deciding a month later, this isn't the right industry for you, which is perfectly fine. We, we welcome that and we're always there to support people as they go through it. So I think really anybody that's looking to start a food business, we open our doors to them and we invite them to come in and utilize the space, come to the classes, come to networking events so that they can really see people who are out there. Um, but for us too, some of the things that we try to pay close attention to is if somebody comes to us and the first thing they say is, I need you to sign 10 NDAs, we're usually going to have to start to think through if they really understand what their business is or if they're saying, I need to copyright my recipe, which you can't do. So we really try to factor that in because our goal is to create as a collaborative environment as possible. And so if somebody says, I just want to rent kitchen space, I don't really want to come to events and classes, that would be a concern for us because it's the, the best thing that we can provide in the environment we've created is the sharing. And it's the entrepreneurs who can connect with one another, whether it be for, you know, just talking about challenges they face, sharing resources, trying to go in on purchasing ingredients together. So that's really valuable. But as a whole, we, we tend to be very inclusive and try to invite people in the door. And then we have different stages of membership, depending on if we do think it's someone who's the right fit to move forward. So I hear a lot about food accelerators and incubators lately. It seems like a very trendy thing. I keep getting news alerts about this big CPG company is doing it or this, and, and you guys are not necessarily big CPG companies, but I'm wondering why you think this has suddenly become such a big buzzy uh, movement that companies big and small are like, oh, we're going to start our own accelerator in dairy or in CPG or in food tech, et cetera. Why do you think now this, is having, this model is having such a moment? Yeah, I think Natalie actually touched on some of those points earlier. I think on one hand, you have these big food companies who recognize that the industry is changing. It's changing very quickly. We've seen a lot of successful acquisitions recently, um, and everyone kind of wants a piece of that pie. You also, on the other hand, have like this like sexiness to food startups. Like it's, I mean, everyone's like for maybe a decade now. People are watching Top Chef. People are looking on Instagram. They're seeing successful D2C brands launch, and it feels like a very attainable thing. The barriers to entry are relatively low um, compared. I mean, sure, you have a scale of starting a cookie business versus building out a fully robotic kitchen. Those are two different businesses. But to launch, especially into the CPG space, feels very attainable, um, which I think is why you're seeing so much excitement in the space. I also think, uh, to Peter's point earlier, it's why it's so important as a startup to get to know the accelerator that you're working with and understand what their objectives are. Are they an accelerator who's being put on by a larger food company who's interested in eventually acquiring 
uh, the companies that are being built in the accelerator? Are they a company like WeWork who's interested in leveraging some of the technologies that are being developed within our accelerator um, to serve the greater good of the WeWork ecosystem? Or are they a, a venture-backed accelerator like the one that Peter operates? So yeah, it's, it's all... Uh, it's all exciting and interesting, but definitely means that more questions need to be asked. I, I think there are a couple of things driving it as well, and you know, from my perspective, I don't know if it's right or wrong, but one is the beyond IPO certainly didn't hurt. The RX bar acquisition two years ago, and the fact that if you look at the food and beverage industry, so traditional tech companies spend somewhere between 15 and 17 percent of revenue on R&D, so that gets reinvested in internal innovation, whereas in the big food and beverage companies, that's typically one to two percent. So they're just not necessarily able to innovate internally in the same way, and they've tried different things over the years, whether that's, you know, grants, whether that's acquisitions, and now they're saying, okay, well, maybe we can put some seed money to work. Maybe we hear about these accelerator things. Let's try that. And, you know, the question is, why are they doing it? What's the goal? In some cases, it's very clear. And so I think those work well. And in others, it's just very muddy. And I think that's where entrepreneurs may end up going and feeling like they don't get the kind of value out because there's just not that clarity of purpose around it. We've noticed the same things, I think, for a lot of the big CPG companies, and we work with many of them who either have some presence within our space, our sponsors for a lot of the programming, whether it be through the philanthropic opportunities or early stage acquisitions. But I think for big CPG, you're much more risk averse. It's very, there's a lot more liability in launching new concepts, and you have a very different model. So in some ways, it is easier if, or feels easier at times to try to target an early stage company that's trying to do things. They're more agile. They're testing things out quicker. They're more connected to their consumer. And so for the big CPG companies, it's a great opportunity to first see what trends are bubbling up at the surface and then also to try to be innovative through another company versus try to change things internally, which they do try. And there's so much innovation in big CPG I was at a conference last week and they were talking about the graveyard of innovation that they've seen in, in big CPG companies and there's so many good ideas that just never come to surface because the model just won't allow for it. It's just so difficult to work through the entire system to launch to market. Um, so a lot of times it's really that opportunity where if you have an arm or extension, if you have an accelerator or an incubator program or a venture program, it makes it a little bit easier to try to test new concepts. Um, and then of course, it's just that engagement. I think again, change is really going to come with the collaboration between big CPG, startup, ingredient companies, suppliers, and distribution. It's no longer going to be separate conversations about in an isolated space, how do we create this concept? How do we get this to market? It's going to be everybody sitting down together. And we see that with all sorts of interesting collaborations where you see Starbucks trying to partner with smaller companies and launch products together. I think there's going to be a lot more of that. And so that's going to kind of pave the way for more of these ideas. But I do agree, it's very murky at times with the amount of incubators and accelerators that are launching. And we get approached many times with those who want to launch an accelerator within a month and aren't sure what to do. And that's a little bit unnerving. But, you know, it's, it'll be interesting to see how that plays out over the next couple of years. It's also interesting to look at who within the company is kind of leading that launch. Is it a PR or marketing team? Is it a venture team? Is it an actual innovation team? Um, and that's something that we see is depending on what company we're talking to, it's a completely different team with a different motive behind why that accelerator or incubator is being launched. Yeah, I mean, I, maybe this is not the nicest thing to say, but I think it depends on the company so, yeah. so much because we've seen some of the big food and beverage companies that they, they come through and they want to be able to put a line item in their annual report that says, look how innovative we are. We went to FoodX. We spent a day with startups, but they have no desire to follow up. They have no real engagement. And then there are others that walk in and they say, here's what we know, here's what we don't know. Like, we know how to produce products at scale. We know how to distribute them far and wide, and we know how to market the hell out of them. 
What we don't know how to do is to get out and talk to our customer at the earliest stage, and that's what we want to learn more about. And those can be really fruitful, but it very much depends on the company. Like some of the collaboration makes me want to just do that because it's a waste of everybody's time. For sure. And when you see like a, like a three-day accelerator, like I would love to sit in on one of those because I don't know what's happening. And technically, yes, you get to check the box if I run an accelerator, but what are you accelerating? So definitely all interesting things to consider. Well, I'm going to open up the floor to audience questions in just one minute. So everyone, think about your questions. But first, I want to pick your guys' brain. You're not getting off the stage without me getting a little bit of intel from you about what you think is coming up next. I mean, no one's more plugged into, you know, the cutting edge. What's, you're always trying to figure out what the new trend is going to be. So as far as you can say, what do you think we should be looking out for? What's new in food? What are you seeing? Like, oh, there's a lot of companies trying to do this. This seems cool. This is intriguing. On our, it's no surprise, but certainly cannabis. We in Chicago, regulation is changing. We have people knocking down our door. Cresco is trying to do these Apple-esque shops and dispensaries. Um, we're trying to figure out what role we're going to play in that space. As a whole, regulation is always going to be the biggest disruptor. So we have to really keep a pulse on what's changing in terms of regulation and ensuring food safety comes first at all times. Um, but I will say there's we have many companies using our space for ghost or dark kitchens. So that is going to continue to develop. Um, but I do think that these lifestyle concepts right now that we're seeing, Lululemon just opened up a, a lifestyle studio in Chicago, which is yoga, cafe, athletic athletic wear, everything in one space, and we're seeing a lot more of that, and that's a lot more of the kind of collaborations that we see being more successful, is how do you take somebody who's really focused on, you know, the fitness industry, partner with them, and tap into a whole new audience from the food side, and build out the collaboration in that way. So we're going to see more industry intersections just getting blurred as a whole. Yeah, I think this is maybe an interesting take being at the Smart Kitchen Summit, but I think we're seeing a transition away from kitchens, at least in the home. So we're seeing... You're talking to Joe Ray, aren't you? <laughs> yeah. Um, we, uh, yeah, so we, I think, are seeing more interesting things happening in spaces like offices and schools. I think we're seeing people wanting more personalized, specific nutrition coming to them on demand versus having to maybe go to a grocery store, bring groceries home, build out whatever meal plan they're building out, and then actually prepare that food. So that's something we're excited about is what does the future of food look like beyond just a traditional home kitchen? I, I would agree with that one. I think for me personally, this is one I get excited about is food as medicine. And, you know, to some extent that may just be a marketing name, but it's this transition from better for you to functional now to really looking at foods that treat chronic disease because the food we've been producing and selling for the last 50 years has created a lot of the health problems. So I, we're seeing a lot of really interesting work, and that goes right into personalized nutrition and bringing advanced technology into the food system, which traditionally has not been the earliest adopter of technology. So I think those are some areas that are really, you know, on the rise. You heard it here first, everybody. Maybe that plant-based stuff. I heard something about that. A little that. bit. About CBD, plant-based. Plant-based. Plant I don't know what that other. is. That sounds like nonsense. <laughs> All right, guys. I know you got some questions. Throw up those hands. I have them if you don't, but... Oh, oh yes, sir. Let me come to you. Perfect. Thanks very much. Yes. All right, thanks. Uh, I'm, I'm taken with your statements about maybe the home is not being perceived, in, at least millennials maybe, as home as much as the workplace and other influential places where you get emotional support, if not nutritional support, and opinions about how you look, how you feel, how things like that. And um, <clears throat> this is particularly interesting because I've been in the kitchen industry for 50 years and 
um, I'm here to find out how it is being viewed by the coming generations, if not being used right now. So um, uh, I have spoken to your partner about, uh, your associate Mohammed, about the, uh, uh, the prospect of creating, you know, the space labs. Not that we work food labs, but we work kitchen, the space labs. And that's, that's an area that's not being discussed. Okay, so my, so my question then is how do we reconcile this shift? Is home not the safe place anymore that we've all come to believe? Is, uh, the, is there a lack of support on the nutritional and emotional su level and things like that in, in your view of the future, such that we need to have that supplemented at our work or other places? Yeah, I mean, um, I think speaking from a, a broader WeWork sense, a lot of what we try to build is very community-based. Um, and my team specifically builds community for earlier stage food and beverage startups. But a lot of the feedback that we get, um, and, and this is from members who are not working for the same companies but are sitting next to one another, is that the most valuable aspect of our programming is the community element. So the fact that they are sitting in the same room with other entrepreneurs who are facing the same challenges. Um, so I, yes, I, I definitely think we're seeing some trends towards people using workspace in a less traditional way. There aren't cubicles anymore. They're big open tables and people are sharing meals at work and food is being delivered into workspaces and people are staying there later and eating dinner there and going home less. So yeah, definitely I think we're seeing this shift towards community in the workspace. Yeah, I mean, I think lifestyles are changing, right? There's more snacking less sitting for three traditional meals a day. And so that's impacting that. And you've got sort of the, the home, the workplace, and then the third place. And so you see companies popping up that do non-traditional experiences around whether it's dining, cooking, other sort of aspects of what we would consider traditionally happening in the home that are happening elsewhere now, I think. Yeah, I, I agree. I think that it's interesting, especially with co-working spaces right now in the design where they're based really around a kitchen, if you look at it, which is really nice to see, is that you have coffee service, uh, you have food that's put out for everybody. We had a chance to visit Google Space, and they're using a lot of human psychology to actually lay out their snacks. So the healthy snacks going on the first drawers, um, the sugary sodas are behind the frosted glass. I think that's going to play a major role in terms of design for the workplace kitchen and how you're going to be consuming hopefully more nutritious, better for you foods at the workplace. Uh, we also talk a lot about how future generations or current generations um, like our buying homes increasingly less so. They're living in urban areas, so they're not making the decisions about the appliances that are in their kitchens. They're also not going to grocery stores to discover new products on shelves. They're shopping online through Instacart. Um, so if we can use the workspace as a showcase for new kitchen technology and new consumer packaged goods, that's a really exciting opportunity. Absolutely. All right, other questions? Ooh, well, let's see if there are other ones, and then I'll get back to you. And also, these people will be around for a little bit more today, so you can find one of them, ask them your most pressing secret questions you're too embarrassed to say out loud. Yes, sir. So you guys talked about um, <clears throat> uh, established big companies coming in and trying to play in your space, but not doing it in a meaningful manner. How would you engage with large manufacturers and uh, producers to make that more meaningful? Because we had a conversation earlier about trying to build out something to get some of this. So I think it's about starting with like speaking the same language. An example I use is we refer to an early stage company and that may be a company that is pre-revenue or has a couple hundred thousand dollars in revenue into a larger food company Early stage means they're only doing $10 million a year in revenue. So first step is let's get on the same page about the language we use and then define what, what people want out of it. Because entrepreneurs want money, they want access, they want credibility that the larger company might have. What does the larger company want out of it? You know, sometimes you see them talking about things in a very esoteric and marketing driven way as opposed to, hey, we're looking for really innovative ideas to spur our 
organization or to acquire or to invest in, and just getting that clarity around that. I think once you get that in place, things can really sort of start to take the next step. It's so much about the conversation and just using our platforms as a starting point for that. Um, it's really easy to imagine that big food companies are run by like Mr. Burns, but when you actually sit down and meet with the teams who are leading innovation in these larger consumer packaged good companies, um, they're wonderful people who just want to understand the, the market and understand where the trends are going and 9.9 .9 times out of 10 are even willing to give their personal time and mentorship to early stage food brands. Yeah, and, and I guess the, the last thing I'll say is understanding also the constraints that the companies have to work within. You know, they're bigger organizations, they're sign-offs, they're things that can be done easily and things that are really hard to do. So the more that the startups or the accelerator or incubator understands about the constraints the big company works within, the more we can collaboratively design something that allows everyone to get out of it what they need. I agree. I think realistic expectations are really important. And sometimes we actually turn away partners because there's that approach of um, somebody who's talking, it's kind of like entrepreneurs in a zoo where you're just walking through and, you know, you're just hoping to catch some idea and then you want a piece of the company. And we try to create a, a very safe space because there's a big disconnect sometimes with the language, understanding what the big CPG companies want, and then also understanding what the startups are looking for and what kind of support they need. So it's really having a very open conversation and having that approach where it is about making those connections and understanding that you're not going to solve every challenge in a month, in a year, even at times. I think everybody's still testing it out to see what does work. And so being open to try something different. We have seen a lot of companies launch successful programs. We partnered with Ingredion, who has an idea labs. They hired a full-time position of a food scientist who is at the hatchery, and all he does is sit with the entrepreneurs, hear their challenges, and try to help them solve it at no fee. And that's proven to be extremely beneficial for Ingredion because they've been able to acquire companies to be customers that way. But in addition, they're able to understand the learnings and understand the challenges from these startup companies because they're spending time acting like them, being with them, and working with them. And I think that's actually been one of the more successful ways that a, a larger company has been able to work with an incubator and accelerator. All right, I think that's all the time we have, unfortunately, but these fine folks will be around for a little bit longer. Come say hello, they're incredible. If you're a startup, maybe check them out, see if it's right for you. If you're a big CPG company, talk about ways to partner, and uh, thank you all for being such an amazing audience. And thank you. Thank you. Thank you.